The history of Japan is rich and filled with fascinating individuals, groups, and events. Of all the historical figures and peoples that have existed in Japan's history, none are quite as well recognized or romanticized as the samurai. The word samurai means to serve, and it is a perfect term to refer to what the samurai primarily were. They were subservient to the daimyo or feudal lords of their lands. In the world of For Honor, however, the samurai is just a term for the warriors of the mire. In this series, we're now covered every hero the samurai faction has to offer, from the Shugoki and his ties to sumo wrestlers, the Aramusha and their ties to the Ronin, and even the Nobushi and their ties to the Onobugeisha. There remains only one more samurai to be covered, and I have saved him for last. Why? Well, for three reasons. The first and most easy reason for me personally was that I don't like playing Orochi all that much, for reasons we might get into later in another video. The second reason is because Orochi was going to be one of the hardest to discuss overall, which leads into the third reason, because he's not based on any specific subcategory of samurai or any special order. He's just a generic samurai. Orochi are quintessentially the stereotypical samurai, from their armor, to their weapon, to their playstyle. They embody the typical pop culture representation of a stereotypical samurai. But if they are just a samurai, how samurai are they? What influences do they take? Let's talk about it. Welcome back to Heroes in History, where we take a look at all of For Honor's heroes and determine who they are most likely based on and whether or not they do their counterparts justice. And today, we are finally taking a look at Orochi. Let's start with Orochi's name and lore in the world of For Honor. In the lore, Orochi are described as assassins who serve the Dawn Empire. They are equal to 100 enemies. They are masters of the katana and experts in the ways of stealth and subterfuge. Each of our warriors must be the match of ten of our enemies. Each Orochi is a match for a hundred. Swift. Strong. The truest masters of the katana. They move like shadows. With lore taken from the ninja clans. They boast armor that is a perfect balance of light, but sturdy quality. Their armor, a perfect balance of flexibility and strength. And they are the finest warriors the world has ever known. Orochi, they are the finest warriors the world has ever known. Now all of it sounds very romanticized and rather generic, right? And yeah, that was the ultimate problem with looking at the Orochi as a unique subgroup. Their generic explanation and armor leads me to believe that the Orochi was meant to be the samurai default. The name Orochi, however, can actually be tied to something. It's likely a reference to the Japanese mythical creature Yamata no Orochi, a giant eight-headed serpent or dragon that has its myth deeply rooted in the heart of Japan. Now, according to legend, the god Susano came down to Earth and found a pair of Earth deities weeping. He asked why, and they explained that a Yamata no Orochi had eaten seven of their eight daughters and were now coming to eat their last one. Susano offered to destroy the monster in exchange for their daughter's hand in marriage, so they agreed, and Susano formed a plan. He set up eight gates far enough from each other that the serpent would have to extend its head out from its body to reach each one and put large cases of sake behind each gate. When the Orochi arrived and took the bait by extending all of its heads through all the gates at the same time, Susano slew the beast and cut it into multiple pieces. After cutting down the monster within its body, he discovered the legendary sword Kusanagi no Surugi, or Grass Cutting Sword. This sword has gone down in history as one of the three imperial regalia of Japan. And ever since this myth, the term Orochi has been used in Japanese pop culture and anime to reference snakes, serpents, and wickedness. The most famous example being Orochimaru from Naruto, who not only has a snake motif, but whose famous sword, the Sword of Kusanagi, is literally a sword he extends from his mouth, implying it lays inside his body, a direct reference to the legend. At least you've made this a little more interesting. of it. One swing of the grass longsword. Then there's also the Boa sisters in One Piece who transform into giant snakes and whose signature techniques involve creating multiple snake monsters from their hair to attack their enemy. In other words, boy, all your little 
little trick has done is awaken our wrath. Medusa here! Eight-headed serpent! My point here about talking all about these pop culture references being that the name Orochi gives a direct tie into Japanese mythology and lore and creates an immediate identity for Orochi. He is comparable to a serpent, using lightning fast strikes, fluid movements, and slippery techniques to evade damage and to attack points of weakness, and a lot of them are pretty damn toxic to boot if I'm being honest. That sums up Orochi perfectly in my opinion. But. That's all a name, and as Shakespeare famously said, what's in a name? What about the samurai aspect? Does he tie into any of his other samurai aspects? And he does. While I do stand by the fact that Orochi is mostly just a pop culture samurai realized, that itself is a big clue to what he's based on. Orochi might be the typical samurai, but I think we can narrow things down a little as to what samurai he's likely based on and what era he's from. Let's take a look at the Orochi a little more closely. I've made a point about it many times before, but the default armor of Orochi always annoyed me because it's made of wood. Wood was never used as a samurai armor, and thus this is irritating, but the style of armor the Orochi wears is similar to Tosei do Gusoku armor, which is essentially samurai plate armor, a type of armor that was introduced in the late Sengoku and early Edo period around 1500. Unlike what Loxton and Nagan said in his video about samurai armor, samurai did have access to steel and lamellar armor, which was exceptional for what was needed, particularly with the advent of firearms. Later versions of Orochi armor do show more accurate armor, at least in material, so I gotta give them that. Now aside from the armor, there's the fact that the Orochi's primary weapon is the katana. Now most people are familiar with the relation between the samurai and their katana, but the katana is not the primary weapon of war for samurai in history. In fact, the katana is a very misunderstood weapon. Let's briefly talk about it as it ties into what era of samurai the Orochi is based on. Why is the katana so closely tied to the samurai and why is it so stereotypical and emblematic of them? There are a couple of reasons. There was an old belief popularized in the mid-Edo period that the katana was the soul of the samurai, and it was customary for samurai to carry a katana wherever they went as a status symbol to let others know their class. See, only the samurai could carry swords thanks to the law of the Edo period, and soon a katana became synonymous with power or status. If you were seen walking around wearing a sword like a katana, you were known to be samurai and therefore very high up in the pecking order, and thus they began to become less weapons of war and more symbols. During that time period, wars were far less common, and it was relative peace for Japan. Japan wasn't having to fight as much. Thus, the necessity of samurai for warfare, being warriors essentially, and military action overall, it just wasn't there. There was no necessity or need for it. This allowed the katana to evolve from a weapon of battle into something more austere, and thus could be forged to look more ornate or beautiful, creating very diverse and unique tsuba and blade patterns and designs that made the sword stand out. People took more care of their swords, there was no need to risk chipping the sword or losing it in battle. Swords might be passed down in families, or be significant to the family they were attached to. Some swords might inherit legends based around them, and swordsmiths of Japan would go on to become legends just for the high quality swords they crafted. At least their legends would go down in history anyway. Now this romanticization of the katana has made the swords gain a culturally significant identity in the eyes of Japan but also to the rest of the world. You see, when the West discovered the katana and its value to the Japanese culture, they learned of the steps it took to make the katana. Shadowversity has a very lengthy series breaking down the katana, another video dedicated to debunking misconceptions about it, and they all go into great detail talking about how katanas are forged, the significance of their creation process, and their weaknesses and strengths. So I won't go into that here, but long story short is this. The Japanese were able to find an ingenious way to create swords using materials and methods of forging different from what the West was used to. The result is a sword that media has popularized as a legendary blade when in truth, it's just an impressive sword with an impressive forging process that few would have anticipated. Now, the result of the Edo period's romanticization of the samurai and their katana led to Eastern and Western media building up more and more upon it. That's why anime gives us constant myths and legends about katana forging, capabilities, and feats. There's one anime in particular that I want to point out is called The Sacred Blacksmith, about a fantasy world in which most characters wield Western-style armor and weapons, but there's this one blacksmith who's found a way to forge katanas, and the whole show revolves around one night girl trying to convince this guy to forge her a katana just because of how classy 
badass they are, how amazing they are. And they go into like this real deep discussion about how why folding the katana so frequently makes it that much stronger. It's it's silly, but it points out exactly what I'm talking about. Not too many blacksmiths can forge katana these days. Most don't have the patience. To do it right, you have to hammer and fold the steel repeatedly. That's what gives it its strength. But folding steel isn't easy. It takes a lot of hard work. That's why most blacksmiths have given up the practice. They don't see the point of spending days making one katana when in the same amount of time they can make hundreds of swords by mold, but their swords are inferior. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, Raven, why are you telling us all this? Get back to Orochi. But hold on. The point I want to make about all this is this. If it's not clear by now, all of these aspects about the samurai and the Orochi, from their weapon to their armor, all tie back to a specific era in Japanese history. Orochi might be a pop culture representation of the samurai, but we must first understand where that pop culture interpretation started to appreciate where he came from. So finally, before we get into it, let's discuss Orochi's fighting style. The standard point that often comes up in the debate about knights versus samurai is the knight's durability versus the samurai's speed. Speed is a common point people like to attribute to samurai. Yes, you might be strong, but the samurai are fast and precise, and Orochi, well, yeah, he does boast some real speed. In fact, the classic joke about Orochi is just how often they employ their speed to run away from a fight. I'm so good at fasting, I make even Gandhi look like a gluttonous casual. Joking aside though, Orochi's entire fighting style revolves around fast movement, employing consistent dodges, lights to expose weaknesses, and retaliations through deflections, dodge back lights, or storm surge rushes. They're not only undodgeable, but can come from three different directions. Orochi's style of fighting is not reflective of a military soldier, but of a lone swordsman, a trope popular with the pop culture version of samurai and anime. Quite often when we think of a samurai, you don't always think about the big army formations of Japanese military, you think of a lone swordsman. And the lone swordsman is a popularized idea of the samurai, and Orochi, well, he definitely embodies it. It's more common with ronin style characters, but it can be attributed to non-discretion warriors as well. Remember when the trailer says a single Orochi is a match for a hundred? I doubt that's a literal truth, more of a point that the Orochi requires no backup and does not stand as a combined unit. An Orochi is a lone warrior, a single viper who can fend for itself, whether they stand their ground against two deadly foes or run with their tail between their legs against all four. <laughs> okay, so now I'm sure some of you are rushing to the comments to tell me, Raven, this is heroes and history, not heroes and pop culture. What are you going to talk about history? But here's the thing, guys. I am discussing history. The legends we create about our heroes come from a place of truth. Why do we create myths, legends, and tall tales? Because they account for a culture, time period, and series of events and circumstances that allow us to create them. In essence, history. You cannot divorce culture from history. So for that reason, I wanted to expose the Orochi's pop cultural references and attributes to finally expose the era in which he's from. I think y'all should have caught it by now, but just in case, let's talk historical samurai in the golden age of the samurai. The samurai first truly came into prominence during the Kamakura Shogunate, which lasted from 1185 to about 1333. During this period, and the Ashikaga Shogunate as well, there were various battles for power and prestige for the samurai clans that existed. Now, the teachings of Zen Buddhism helped to shape the mindset and cultural ideals of samurai, ridding them of their fear of death and killing of others. And after two Mongolian invasions, the samurai proved themselves as capable warriors, the likes of which were able to withstand an invasion from Kublai Khan's Yuan Dynasty, a feat few cultures at the time could claim to have done. However, during the Sengoku Jidai, or the Warring States period, the title of samurai was made much more loose. As clans fought for power and control, they used far more peasant or conscripted footmen in their military, called Ashigaru. These light-armored spearmen, formed up alongside cavalry charges and the introduction of firearms from Portuguese traders, allowed some daimyo, like Oda Nobunaga, to take advantage of firing lines. Military tactics and strategies became far more prominent and creative in this period, but most importantly, the title of samurai was one that almost anyone could potentially obtain by pleasing their daimyo or feudal lords and obtaining that title. A man of low upbringing could potentially rise in station to a higher position if he earned the favor of his master, such as how the mere sandal bearer Tokichiro would one day become Oda Nobunaga's close vassal Toyotomi Hideyoshi. 
Now, all the things changed when the three unifiers of Japan finally brought an end to the war. Oda Nobunaga managed to take Kyoto, but his victory was short-lived as he was betrayed by his vassal, Akechi Mitsuhide. Toyotomi Hideyoshi would avenge Nobunaga and take control of the capital himself, but not having been born samurai himself, he could not officially be a shogun, so he simply became, re became regent of Japan being a shogun in power, but not in name. After his death, Tokugawa Ieyasu would rise up, defeat his rival Ishida Mitsunari, and claim the shogunate as his own, thus starting the Tokugawa Shogunate, also known as the Edo period of Japan. This is widely considered the golden age of the samurai, and it is this period that I believe Orochi takes his inspiration. Why? Not only is the armor he wears similar to the style of the armor of the Edo period, the Tosei Gusoku, not only is his devotion to the katana similar to the lore and romanticism of the katana that emerged during the Edo period, but because it is the Edo period that truly solidified the samurai as not only the pop cultural icons we like to think about, but also where we get most of our ideas about samurai in general. Concepts like Bushido codes and the like were born during the Edo period, katana myths and legends were popularized here, the samurai solidifying as an unwavering social class that, could that one could not simply become without being born into it, was instigated just as the Edo period was beginning. Well, to be technical, it was actually started by Hideyoshi before the Edo period officially began, but that's semantics. Our conceptual ideas of the samurai are what formed the Orochi, and we obtained those conceptual ideas from what the Edo period did to them. Take legendary samurai that were immortalized in fiction, anime, art, and media. It was often taken from elements of what the Edo period helped build them up to be for the three, three centuries that it lasted. Now, the Edo period would end with the collapse of the Tokugawa Shogunate in 1869. While the samurai would remain for a while afterwards under imperial rule, the advent and building of a modern military under the guidance of American, British, and French aid and resources made the samurai become less and less useful and far more expensive. By the 1870s, only 5% of Japanese families were considered samurai, and the ones that did exist were not pleased about the gradual stripping of their rights and privileges. And in 1877, there was a backlash and localized rebellion by samurai against the dissolving of the samurai class, which failed miserably at the Battle of Shiroyama. And by 1879, the samurai class had been dissolved almost entirely. However, the legacy of the samurai would endure forever, long after the final samurai fell to modernity and societal advancement. The Orochi is a character that sparks so much controversy in the Ferrana community. Is he a broken character with too much in his toolkit? Is he a really engaging and entertaining character that really seems to capture that lone samurai feel that we seek in the game? Is he just a cowardly runner who evades any direct fight he can? There are so many ways we can look at Orochi, to judge him and to follow him, but maybe that too is a testament to what he represents, to what he's based on. We cannot seem to truly understand our stance when it comes to the samurai. Are they truly remarkable warriors worthy to stand amongst the echelon of great historical fighters and soldiers? Are they overrated and weak tier fighters who couldn't hold their own against a professional military outside of Japan? Are their weapons truly the stuff of legend, or are they just overblown pieces of bitter steel? All of us have come to our own conclusions about the samurai, just as we have come to our own conclusions about Orochi. The samurai will never die will never stop being relevant, and their legacy will forever remain in the hearts of every person who seeks to understand Japan, warfare, and military history. Now, I admire the samurai as historical figures and warriors. I admire the deeds they accomplished, the ideals they crafted and stood for. I admire the samurai. I always have. And while I can't say Orochi fully encapsulates every historical truth about the samurai, I can see the legacy of the samurai in his design, his weapon, and his capabilities. He, like the samurai, will always have a unique place in my heart. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you in my next video. You lost Sun C. Body work on you. Zone A! What? What just happened? Give it a second. No, really, they're just- No, no, hold on. Yeah, it took me a whole three months to get that one down. They make it look a lot easier than it really is. Surprise, mother
crap. Nice hustle, tons of fun. Next time, eat a salad. Mother of mercy, is this the end of Rico? Ah!